All right, welcome everybody. My name is Renee Trevino. I am an attorney with Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid. Um, TRLA, as we call ourselves, is a private nonprofit law firm. We serve um, 68 of Texas's most southernmost and western counties, um, basically from the county of Victoria up to Williamson County and out to El Paso County. Everything south of that line is part of the service area for Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid. Um, and we provide free legal representation to low income individuals. I am also the team manager for our Veterans Advocacy Project. Um, our Veterans Advocacy Project strives to provide free legal representation to low income veterans and work with other organizations that provide services to veterans on a day to day basis. Um, also today with us is Lori Hallmark, who's representing our TRLA Mental Health Project. I'm going to let her introduce that. Uh, so I'm Laurie Hallmark, and uh, my project focuses on serving people with mental health challenges. So with veterans, we look at a lot of PTSD, and our goal is to be able to provide advanced planning documents like psychiatric advanced directives, but basically advanced planning documents. And we're sort of a one-stop shop for hopefully holistic legal uh, advocacy. Um, so that's, that's who we are. All right. And just another note about TRLA generally in our Veterans Advocacy Project, we provide representation in the full scale or, um, of civil legal issues. So anything non-criminal. Um, and we focus many times on wills, probate, advanced directives, like Lori mentioned, uh, we work on helping people obtain benefits, whether from the Social Security Administration, the Department of Veterans Affairs, Health and Human Services Commission. We have attorneys who work on consumer matters, civil rights matters, family law matters. So it's a wide swath of representation that we provide. Now, today we have Brittany Perigy, who is our managing attorney for our disaster benefits team. And she represents low-income individuals affected by disaster specifically. Um, Brittany is also the vice director of the American Bar Association Young Lawyers Division Disaster Legal Services Team. So Brittany, she'll be our main presenter today. Thank you, Renee. Thank you, Lori. Thank you everyone for having me here to present to you today on um, such an important topic. Um, like Renee said, um, Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid provides free legal services to residents of 68 counties in South Central and West Texas. Um, and prior to COVID, we were serving, you know, somewhere around 23,000 clients each year. Um, but unfortunately, due to the pandemic, that number has probably and likely has increased um, based on the um, number of families who have been impacted financially um, and the, the um, new legal problems that have arose because of the winter storm as well as um, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and we do have, like Renee was saying, we practice in many different areas. So pretty much anything that's not criminal, we have an attorney at our firm who likely can give you advice or information or even representation on that matter. Um, today, we're here to talk about um, some of the resources and benefits that are available to veterans um, and those uh, who were impacted by winter storm Yuri in February um, of this year. Um, and this is a really great map kind of depicting where uh, resources are available based on county. And the website you can visit is FEMA's website, um, particularly to see this map as well as um, updated press releases and information about uh, financial assistance available, but any area that is um, red on this map, so any county included in red, is um, eligible for FEMA individual assistance. You may have heard um, right after the winter storm or even really maybe during the winter storm, depending on where you're located, that all counties in Texas were declared a disaster by um, the governor as well as the federal government. Um, it's a little confusing because um, that means all counties in yellow and red were approved for public assistance. I mean, that's money that goes to government um, for critical infrastructure and shelters and things like that, warning centers for the storm. Um, but the counties located in red, as I mentioned, are eligible for individual assistance, meaning money that can go 
to the household to assist with repairs or replacement of personal property or transportation. Um, and again, these are just a few areas that we uh, practice in commonly. Um, Trala has a very extensive history of um, responding to natural disasters. Um, we have worked on cases from Hurricane Katrina, another really big storm that um, happened more recently is Hurricane Harvey. We respond to the almost annual flooding events in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, and we are currently responding to winter storm URI. And one way that we're able to assist with um, representing disaster survivors and their families is um, by providing them legal information or legal advice about various uh, federal and state programs um, that they may be able to get access or assistance from. Um, we're able to um, prepare documents for them, whether that be appealing an administrative decision um, determined by FEMA or by the state of Texas, um, or if it's uh, drafting a deed to help prove the ownership of a home um, for future disaster assistance. We do represent clients before administrative agencies. We do those written appeals um, to disaster assistance agencies, as well as um, sometimes we can do extended representation for fair hearings or oral and telephonic hearings in front of administrative judges um, to get access to benefits. And then um, attorneys represent clients in, you know, justice of the peace court, also sometimes referred to as small claims court um, in state and federal court. Um, sometimes we tend to think that um, in the aftermath of a disaster, you know, you have your traditional first responders, you have your police officers and firefighters and EMS, individuals who are um, helping to get the lights turned back on, make sure that water is um, available all over um, for everyone getting access to shelters. But it's also a good idea to think of attorneys and in, in, in that group as well. Um, because sometimes right after a disaster, getting access to food, water, and shelter sometimes does require an attorney or would benefit from having an attorney involved. Um, there may be a, a situation where an individual is not being allowed into a shelter. Um, for whatever reason, an attorney may be able to assist with that. If it has something to do with uh, getting uh, food stamps replaced, whether that's being, happening automatically or not, it's often a good idea to consult an attorney um, on those sorts of benefits. Um, and it can also be where water distribution sites are located. Um, maybe they're not being um, spread out throughout the community in a fair and equitable way. And um, often attorneys can work with co the community and maybe rectifying that problem right away. Uh, we know legal issues exist prior to storms. Um, new legal issues do tend to arise after a disaster, but um, the ones that exist prior to are often made worse um, depending on um, the circumstance. We see a lot of um, landlord tenant cases that, um, that happen after a storm, whether they be evictions for non-payment of rent, um, or maybe a landlord is using um, that as a workaround for the CDC moratoriums um, or damages to apartments. There's a rise in consumer and fraud issues. We often see um, a surplus of, um, you know, in the storm plumbers or um, other individuals who are coming into the area and are wanting to do good work and help repair damages caused by disasters. Um, but sometimes that group um, may have one or two individuals who um, might not have the best intentions. And so that often um, happens after a storm um, and then, you know, applying for new benefits or making sure that your federal benefits, um, if you get them by check, seeing if you can get them changed to direct deposit because the mail system is down. And um, those are all issues that we can help with. And then we, we know, and it's been proven over and time and time again, that marginalized communities are especially vulnerable after a disaster. Um, their legal problems tend to be exacerbated um, in ways that are much worse. And so after a storm, we can kind of think of uh, the legal needs um, on a timeline. 
And this is a great infograph. I won't go over the entire thing because I want to make sure we have time for questions, but it's a great reference point, um, both for um, advocates and social workers who are able to assist disaster survivors, but also for um, disaster survivors ourselves to kind of have an idea of when we might anticipate a problem arising for us. Um, you know, one to six weeks after a storm, we're going to see people filing for insurance claims and applying for those disaster benefits, replacing lost documents like social security cards or um, driver's license, um, and getting access to food stamp replacement, as well as um, maybe getting disaster unemployment if they were impacted in a way they couldn't go to work for a while. One to six months after we're seeing a lot of administrative appeals, um, evictions potentially utility cutoffs um, and increases in family law and housing and consumer cases. And then um, depending on the type of the disaster, the long term, we anticipate somewhere from six months to potentially years. We anticipate Hurricane Harvey's response will be ongoing for several years and that storm happened in 2017. Um, but that's when we typically see foreclosures and bankruptcies, a lot of title clearing um, and a lot of preparation um, for the next uh, natural disaster. Right now, the, the main case types we're seeing um, a huge increase in and is no surprise based on the timeline we just discussed are housing cases and family cases and um, because of the nature of this storm, consumer cases. Um, again, evictions, Family is a lot of, you know, increase in domestic violence or modifications of um, custody that need to be done uh, if, some if a family member had to relocate to a different part of the state. And then consumer issues, we're seeing a handful of utility cases, some um, construction, but a lot of insurance cases as well. Um, at the beginning of this presentation, when you signed on, there was a um, slide with a bunch of hotline numbers for individuals, um, veterans yourselves to use. Um, it's a workaround from our main hotline number, which is here on this slide. Um, and I'll put it back up at the end of this presentation so that you can have it um, to call and speak to a paralegal directly about having about your legal problem and having an intake done that way. But if for some reason you're not able to call the veterans hotline, this is our general Chala hotline number. Um, it is open Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Our law firm um, right now, our offices are closed to the public um, because of the pandemic and we are working remotely um, due to COVID-19, but we are doing our best to make sure that all of our hotline calls are getting answered or getting a call returned, but there are um, those veteran lines that you may be able to get through quicker. Um, and then you can always check online um, to see other ways um, in which you may be able to apply. If you happen to be residing in uh, one of those counties that is in the yellow from the, uh, the picture that I showed you earlier, um, I highly um, encourage you to fill out this um, self-reporting damage or a preliminary damage assessment survey um, from Texas Division of Emergency Management. It is a tool it's called the iStat in which you report, self-report your damages to your home. Um, you can take pictures um, so that the government can have, or the state of Texas can have an idea of where the damage is located within the state. They uh, take that information based on county um, and then form a number to report to uh, FEMA in order to see if that county then can be declared for individual assistance. So switching from yellow, where money is only going to um, local governments, to red, where money can now go into the individual's um, individual household. Um, so really important. It's um, I, So I highly encourage you all to do that. And it is also available um, in Spanish. So when you go to the survey online, it'll load in English, but you can click here and it should uh, give you a Spanish option as well. Um, my team primarily works on FEMA cases, whether those be appeals or assisting individuals um, with advice on virtual inspections at this point for winter storm URI, um, or maybe there's a, uh, a preliminary issue that's preventing an individual from applying. We're looking at those cases as well. Um, FEMA appeals begin 
as soon as the first inspections are complete, though we're kind of seeing new problems this storm because everything is being done virtually. Um, so applications online for FEMA are online through disasterassistance.gov or um, by calling FEMA's hotline. And so there's some newer problems that are arising where individuals are being told that they can't apply. Um, and we are helping them resolve that problem and helping them get access to those resources. Um, but generally, after the first inspection, an individual will get a notification or determine a decision from FEMA about whether what type of assistance they are either approved for or they are denied um, assistance. And there should be a letter explaining why they've been denied. And we can step in and help um, appeal those decisions. Um, and so the deadline to apply for FEMA assistance for home repairs, personal property, transportation, all kinds of things. Um, rental assistance is April 20th, 2021. So immediately after a storm, uh, you're going to want to file your insurance claim right away um, and apply with FEMA, the Small Business Administration, and any other disaster benefits agency um, as soon as possible. You might be asking why you need to apply for a Small Business Administration disaster loan, um, and that is that's a good question. Um, it's because the name of the agency is confusing. They actually lend to individuals, not just businesses, in the aftermath of a disaster. So they are able to help with low interest, long-term loans. We'll talk about this a little bit more later um, to help repair or replace damaged personal property or um, home repair. Um, so do you have to make sure that you actually do apply for the SBA loan? It does not um, hurt your credit in order to um, apply if you do need financial assistance and failing to do so may actually preclude you from receiving other forms of grant money um, from FEMA later down the line. Um, and then after you do those things, you're going to want to document the condition of your house um, and also your belongings. So uh, your furniture, your appliances um, right after the storm. You should try to do this before you start making repairs or if you need to muck and gut your home or rip out drywall and start mold remediation and things like that. You're gonna wanna take the pictures before and throughout the process. You want as much proof as possible to show what your house was like because of winter storm Yuri. Um, again, you wanna take as many photos as possible um, prior to getting rid of any of those damaged items like appliances or, um, or furniture. And not going to put you at a health risk because the item is getting moldy or it's gross. Um, if you could save that item for when your insurance adjuster came out so that they could actually see it, that would be beneficial. Um, FEMA virtual inspections are happening a couple of different ways, um, mostly over the phone, but there is an option to have it done via Zoom or FaceTime. Um, and so if they could see the damaged item, um, that might be beneficial as well, though photos will work too. You'll want to keep any estimate or receipt you have from making repairs, invoices, all of that evidence is going to be, or all of that documentation is going to be great evidence to help win an appeal or uh, maybe work with your insurance company for the future. And then again, photos, videos, and you know, if you have family members who are there, you know, making sure if they're, they've witnessed anything, maybe you know, getting a statement from them about what they saw. Um, so FEMA housing assistance is available for homeowners and renters, um, and they can provide assistance in the form of rental assistance, um, home repair, um, but it's not like insurance. It's not going to return your home to create a disaster condition. The goal for FEMA is to make your home safe and sanitary. And the best way I talk to my clients about this is more of a, a shelter in place standard. Um, do you have, you know, a, a livable bedroom, kitchen, bathroom, wanting, running water, um, living room for e uh, and a bedroom for each person? And if the answer is yes, um, then you're going to you're going to see less assistance or no assistance from FEMA. It is not going to put your house um, back to what it looked like before. FEMA will just tell you that you would have needed to have insurance to get that. So um, a, a lower habitability or lower living standard for sure. 
And then in certain instances, though, I think limited with winter storm URI, FEMA can help with home replacement if it's destroyed, um, but it's not enough to actually buy a new home um, or build a new home. It would likely need to be um, assistance also provided by the Small Business Administration in order to do that. Brittany, we have a question. Um, okay. Now, Ray has asked that he says that he's tried and was denied by FEMA. He thinks it's because he does have insurance, but his insurance company did not call all, cover all of the expenses and the expenses are ongoing and there's a 1% deductible uh, for his insurance. This is out of pocket and he does not have it. Uh, he still, for example, is without any permanent water. What are his options? Yeah, so first of all, I would tell Ray to apply for the free legal services from Trolla. There's a couple things that can be going on there, but generally, um, as you can see on this slide, I believe it's bullet point four, um, FEMA is gonna require that you have insufficient or no insurance coverage. So um, if you have more damage than what your insurance company is willing to pay for, um, FEMA may be able to assist with that. FEMA can't duplicate benefits, um, meaning they can't pay for the same thing that your insurance is. But again, if your damages are more than what your insurance company is paying for, um, FEMA might be able to assist with that. Um, also, there are limited and very specific circumstances in which FEMA might be able to assist with a deductible. Um, an attorney would need uh, more information or detailed look at your case, which is why I would say it would be helpful um, to apply to have uh, one of the attorneys at trial look at it. But generally, if you can show that your insurance company has denied you assistance, providing that insurance denial will, um, will be helpful um, for FEMA. Or like if, you're, um, if the damage is more than what your insurance company is going to pay for, having estimates of repair that show that in comparison to what a letter from your insurance company stating what they're going to pay um, will also be helpful for FEMA. The other issue there is, right, why is your insurance company um, undervaluing damage or are they? Um, and that's a question also for an attorney to look at and to investigate and kind of determine um, if they are valuing the damage appropriately or if there's a way to protest or um, ask for a, um, a separate appraisal to be done in order to make sure that your insurance company is properly paying for the, the damage um, to your home. Um, thank you, Renee. So another, um, some more eligibility for getting access to FEMA, the, the house will need to be in one of those red counties from the map before, um, which is a disaster declared area, but for individual assistance, not public assistance. Um, the home is not livable or um, you can't access the home because of the disaster for one reason or another, or the house needs repairs to make it habitable again. But remember, it's that lower standard of um, habitability. Um, an individual will, or an individual household member, maybe not necessarily um, you know, the owner of the house, but if it's a uh, spouse or if a um, child that resides in the house is a US citizen, LPR, or, or legal permanent resident or qualified alien, then the household could be eligible for FEMA assistance. Um, we talked about the insurance issue and then ownership. Uh, the applicant will need to show that they um, own the home and have occupied the home at the time of the disaster. Um, another important thing to note about FEMA is that FEMA benefits aren't taxed. They're not considered income. So it should not affect uh, your other means tested public benefits. Um, and you, you have to use the FEMA assistance the way FEMA tells you to. So if FEMA gives you $3,000 for rental assistance, you really should try to use it for rental assistance um, because FEMA can audit, go back and audit cases. They say they do a random sampling out of um, all of the disaster cases and ask for proof that you spent the money in the way they um, told you to. So whether it be for home repair, rental assistance, replace personal property. Um, so you'll wanna have those receipts to back that up and they can ask for it for up to three years. 
Um, and if you don't, aren't able to prove it, then FEMA can ask for the grant money back and that you would pay it. Um, and because it is a federal benefit, um, there are different ways that they may be able to get that, whether that be from your federal income tax return or other federal benefits that they may garnish. Uh, FEMA can provide rental assistance. This is to rent a place from either a private owner, whether that be a house or an apartment comp or apartment or duplex. It can be used after a disaster because there are um, housing shortages and um, stock available. So it could be used to rent a single room from a motel or a hotel, but I would call FEMA and get approval for that first. Um, and also keep in mind that you will likely go through the money a lot faster if you're going through a hotel um, than if you were to go month to month at an apartment potentially. Um, it is not to be used for um, public housing and really it shouldn't be used to stay with friends or family members unless you enter into some sort of written or some sort of agreement about maybe renting a room at their house and you can show that you're paying rent and maybe keep like one of those little receipt books to document that. Um, you can also, so rental assistance is initially provided in um, two month increments, um, depending on the cost of living and the county in which the disaster or where the disaster survivor resides. Um, you can ask for additional rental assistance and it can be requested about two months at a time, but you will have to complete a rental assistance packet. And um, that means uh, they, they require a lot of documentation and information. Um, it's something that our attorneys and paralegals assist with quite often. Um, they can be a little tricky depending on the way the question is asked or if you don't have all of the documents required that they're asking for. Um, so um, you do need to, if you go through the first two months of rental assistance and need more, you can ask FEMA to send you that rental assistance packet. Um, but you will need to provide the sort of supporting documents um, to show your pre-disaster and post-disaster income, um, as well as disaster expenses, and that you can show why you need additional rental assistance. Um, and then eventually you'll have to show what your permanent housing plan is. Uh, so common problems that we can help with um, and issues that my team specifically looks at um, are um, right now with Winter Storm URI issues regarding uh, virtual inspections um, from FEMA. Like I said, there's um, some issues with applications happening or people not being allowed to apply. There are also issues with um, getting the first inspection done um, and being able to request that. Normally it's pretty automatic, but with um, you know, the social distancing measures in place with uh, FEMA because of the pandemic, it's a little more complicated now. Um, and then helping people make sure that they get the fair inspection that they're due, whether that be um, in Spanish or in English, or if they need to do it um, with an ASL interpreter, making sure all of those accommodations are done. Um, we can help with um, fam multiple families who live under one household. That's a common issue we end up seeing a lot. Um, if there is an identity problem that is flagged, it's not necessarily because um, an application is fraudulent. It might just be um, FEMA hasn't verified or needs additional documentation to verify your identity. Um, ownership and title is something we can help clear, um, clear up and explain the legal standards in Texas. Um, because FEMA is federal, so often they don't um, understand Texas real property law. And so we're able to explain that to them and help people get assistance. There's um, something out there called insufficient damage or it's worded a different way almost every disaster. So um, you might see on a denial letter, damage not caused by the disaster or um, your house is safe to live in or safe to occupy. Um, we can help contest that. Um, and make sure that you get assistance um, to uh, help make those repairs. We talked about the insurance bar um, and having to make additional arguments about um, why you need assistance in addition to your insurance coverage or if your insurance company has denied you. Um, and then again, that damage is not caused by the storm. Real briefly, um, I had mentioned the Small Business Administration Disaster Loan Program. 
it is a loan, whereas FEMA is a grant, um, but you should still apply for it just so um, you're not precluded from grant assistance in the future. Um, the, you will have to be found to have the ability to repay the loan, but the standards are much more flexible than they are in a traditional lending market. Um, and so it, it can, in some instances, be a great um, loan product for um, a disaster survivor to utilize. Um, the interest rates for individuals are about 1.75% to help repair or replace personal property. And if you happen to be a veteran um, or have a family member who um, has a business, those disaster loans start about 3.5% interest. Both are not terrible. They're actually pretty good. Um, the loans last for about 30 years. You can shorten that and you can also pay it off before then. Um, there are no prepayment penalties. So um, one thing that often does come up is if your insurance company is taking a long time to pay or process that claim because there's 2 million people who were impacted by a disaster, um, you could apply for an SBA loan, get approved, start the repairs on your home, and when your insurance proceeds were actually paid out, you can pay off the SBA loan in this way. And then um, you'd be able to recover, in theory, a little bit faster. Um, but because it is a loan, there are often times where insurance, um, you might have to get additional forms of insurance, whether that be windstorm or flood. Um, sometimes you might, depending on the amount of the loan, so if it's over $25,000, you might have to do it kind of like a mortgage where your house is the collateral to the loan. So I would say if you are really considering one of these um, disaster loans, you should talk to an attorney and consult with them about what the uh, legal requirements will be for you, as well as the Small Business Administration when moving forward on. If you are a renter um, and your rental home becomes totally uninhabitable, um, you have different rights after a disaster. You may have the right to terminate your lease, though totally uninhabitable isn't necessarily defined. So it's going to be a question of fact when you get to um, JP court or yeah, justice of the peace court or small claims court. Um, if it's partially damaged, you may be able to sue for rent reduction. But again, that's going to be a question of fact. I would consult an attorney at that point um, if you are trying to exercise those options. You do have the right to request repairs as a renter um, from your landlord. It's best to do this um, in writing and send it um, certified mail return receipt requested. It, I know it seems really convenient sometimes to just scan the letter um, or just tell your landlord, but it really is best as we talked about evidence is gonna be key in a lot of these situations to make that um, a written request and send it in the mail, certified mail return receipt requested. So you get that little green card of proof that they actually received it. Um, and in order to do this, um, you need to be up to date on rent. That might be a particular problem with Winter Storm Uri because Winter Storm Uri has happened, um, you know, almost a year into the pandemic. And so um, some family or yourself might be behind on rent. So you might have um, a problem there. Again, I would consult an attorney. Renee, I see you've unmuted. Yes, a quick question. If a renter has asked and provided the certified mail with return receipt requested, request for repairs, and the landlord refuses to make the repairs, can the tenant refuse to pay rent? No, you should keep paying rent as, as best you can. I know that that sounds really um, unfair, and it, it kind of is, but um, staying up to rent um, is what gives you protections moving forward. And so again, if that were to happen, I would talk to a lawyer, you know, call legal aid, call this hotline number right here or call one of the veterans hotline numbers so that you can talk to one of our housing attorneys who um, is up to date on um, all of the CDC moratoriums as well as the, um, the unique uh, aspects of the law that are impacted by natural disasters, just to make sure you're doing everything absolutely right so you don't end up losing your case in the end because of something like that. Um, 
a landlord can't just evict you after a natural disaster and just lock you out. They, you have the right to proper notice um, to vacate and they need to follow a proper eviction procedure. That doesn't always happen, um, but you do have the right to that. And so you should, again, consult a lawyer um, and just to get some advice on how to defend yourself um, from that eviction. Um, unless you or your landlord terminate your lease, you do, as I was just saying, have the duty to continue paying rent, even if your home is uninhabitable. And um, FEMA does provide, like I said, rental assistance and continued rental assistance, but they do not help renters make repairs to the actual apartment or house or structure um, because that is the landlord's duty. And landlords are not eligible for FEMA assistance. They will likely need to apply for a small business administration loan or have um, an application for their insurance policy, maybe filing a claim. Um, if you do have homeowner's insurance, that's gonna be the primary form of insurance for winter storm fury. Um, go through your policy and really read through um, what uh, types of perils or damage um, are covered by your insurance. It is likely that if you have homeowner's insurance, you may be able to file a claim um, for your insurance to pay out. Now, um, as we discussed before, your deductible might be more than what insurance is willing um, to pay out on. And so that could be problematic. I, a water damage can be quite extensive, but um, depending on the level of damage to your home, that might actually be an issue you have to investigate um, and maybe even contest in the future. Um, you need to complete repairs um, on your home or vehicle that are reasonable and necessary. Um, insurance isn't really going to um, be great if you had, you know, if you're upgrading everything in your house from, you know, uh, laminate flooring to marble flooring or, you know, turning your house into the top hall. You have to be reasonable. Um, on what what your what your repairs are and the cost of those things. So if you're working to repair your home and you notice that the costs of um, construction equipment or you know lumber, tile, drywall, if that has substantially increased, you might actually um, be be taken advantage of by some form of price gouging, and you can report that to the attorney general's office. Um, and they will investigate the claim regarding price gouging. So make sure that you're you're you know you're not getting taken advantage of there. Um, you'll need to file your insurance claim, record the policy number and the individuals you've talked to. Sometimes, um, sometimes if you're not submitting it online and you're actually calling your agent, you want to make sure that the the claim has actually been filed um, and not that they just took the information and plan on doing it later. Um, and then you're gonna to need to have proof of losses such as receipts for hotel and shelter or descriptions of the damages in the property to include. Again, photos are gonna be really helpful. You're gonna to have to fill out a lot of documents um, detailing the damages to your home as well as your personal property and submit that to the insurance company. Um, and you'll want to get multiple written estimates of repair and invoices for completed repairs. Um, it's, a, it's a good idea to try to get at least three written estimates of repair so that you can, um, you know, maybe not go with the cheapest one and not with the most expensive one, but also to make sure that the pricing is pretty standard across the board and that you, again, aren't getting taken advantage of um, in, in that way. And then estimates of repair should be free. Um, so if you're being asked to pay for an estimate of repair, um, I, I would likely not go with that individual um, because they are so often free. Um, for home repair scams, you know, you're going to want to look out for offers to fix your home door to door salesmen or individuals who just happen to stop by and notice that you um, have damages. I would be skeptical of that. Sometimes they're, you know, good Samaritans out there. Um, but a lot of times we see that as like the base level of a scam forming um, individuals just showing up. Um, if the estimate is way lower than um, others or they are asking you or pressuring you to sign contracts right away, um, giving you a one day deadline to make a decision um, when you've expressed that you would like to get multiple opinions. Um, that can be an indication that the person is um, 
you know, maybe um, they may be busy or they may be trying to pressure you um, to pay upfront. Um, do not, if they don't want to put anything in writing, I would say that that is um, very problematic. Um, you should always make sure that anything you're doing with construction or repairs to your home is put in writing um, and is itemized with costs of repairs because things add up and work says it's going to get done and it doesn't and you need something to enforce if you have to in court. If they ask for cash up front or all of your FEMA money or and they say they're going to go buy labor and they just want to be paid up front, I would be very hesitant to do that. I actually advise my clients to not pay everything up front, but to pay an installment as you go. Never provide your social security number or um, any personal identifying information that's not necessary. None of that should be required for an estimate or to enter into a contract for your home repair. Um, so I would be very skeptical of something like that. And then most frequently what we see um, is offers to complete jobs with um, leftover materials. So if they have bought lumber to repair one house, but they didn't need it anymore and they're going to use it on your house. I would be skeptical of that. Um, and often what we see are, um, you know, wanting to fix window seals with uh, or baseboards with um, items that were damaged by the storm and they are just reinstalling them and painting over um, something to also be highly concerned. about. Um, some individuals may have lost documents. During the disaster, we see this a lot after hurricanes and floods as well as um, tornadoes, but it is possible that that happened um, if a pipe burst in your home and you may have lost your ID or birth certificate or public benefits documents, some of your veterans documents or immigration documents. Um, there are each agency, company, all of them have different methods in replacing them. One of the really important things to do here is identify which documents you need to replace um, and maybe prioritize which ones are going to be the most essential, right? Having an ID is going to be pretty essential for almost every form of disaster assistance you're going to apply for, um, but needing, you know, your public benefits documents and your veteran documents are going to be pretty high up on the list as well. And so I would prioritize those and then know that Many entities will waive the fees for replacing those documents or cards if it was destroyed um, because of the disaster. So even if you don't see it on their website, maybe when you call, if you're calling, um, you know, the unemployment office or if you're calling, um, you know, the DMV, ask them if they're waiving fees for um, individuals and counties impacted by winter storm urine. They often do, and that can really help. Um, save money and also help you uh, replace them because if you're not having to pay up front, you might be able to get it done a little bit faster. Some resources specific um, for veterans after a disaster. There, I'm sure many of you are aware there is a veteran crisis line um, that you can call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and there are multiple options um, for you to be able to access this resource. Um, additionally, VA home loans after a disaster, um, you might be able to get a 90 day freeze on a foreclosure um, if your home was impacted by a disaster. Um, you might also be able to get late fees um, waived if um, you are unable to make a payment or you were running a couple of days late because, you know, the storm caused some problem. Um, but the main thing is to know to call your loan um, servicer and, and communicate with them up front um, and let them know that you may need help on um, payment resolutions um, in the future. You can also um, speak to the Veterans Health Administration if you had medical equipment that was damaged because of the storm. Um, you should contact your primary care service team and they may be able to support you in replacing some of that equipment. Um, FEMA does help with replacing um, medical equipment damaged by a disaster, but um, it can't, you'll have to show that your medical insurance doesn't cover it, nor does any other benefit you have. And then additionally, if you have a guide or service dog um, that may um, have been injured or impacted by the disaster, um, you, there are also, um, you can contact the Veterans Health Administration for assistance.
Um, for other forms of assistance, you should go to uh, www.disasterassistance.gov. They have a whole page um, on their website dedicated to um, resources for veterans. And then um, real quickly, I just wanted to mention starting Monday, April 12th, um, if you know somebody or have had a family member pass away because of COVID-19, um, FEMA is going to start providing um, financial assistance to reimburse for funeral costs. Um, in order to be eligible for that type of assistance, um, the individual would have had to have passed away within the United States, including um, DC, as well as uh, the US territories. Um, the death certificate would have to indicate that the death was attributed to COVID-19. Um, and there may be ways to maybe get um, clarity on some death certificates if that's not indicated on there, but that is the cause of death. Um, and so you should talk to somebody about that. Um, the applicant has to be a US citizen, non-citizen, national or qualified alien. Um, so basically if you're the one, or whoever paid for the funeral expenses um, after January 20th, 2020. So they are backdating um, the reimbursement to the very beginning of the pandemic. And um, it's important to know that it's the person who's applying for the benefit or paid for the funeral um, expenses that has to be the citizen, non-citizen, national or qualified alien. It does not have to be the person who has passed away because of COVID um, in order to get that funeral assistance. Um, like I said, the applications open up on April 12th, 2021. Um, and unlike other forms of disaster assistance, um, the funeral assistance is being taken, applications are being taken um, over the phone. And I don't believe at this time there is a way to apply online or in person for that. That may change. This is a, a new program given the pandemic and the way they're doing this. So there may be additional application um, avenues in the future, but for right now, what they've done is created a hotline. Um, and then finally, uh, we have updated our website um, at Trala to have a winter disaster um, page where there are many resources um, for individuals or individuals, family members um, to get free legal information. Um, it's uploaded on the website. You can click on multiple links and it'll give you a PDF about um, FEMA virtual inspections or tips on applying for disaster assistance, as well as other housing issues. I've linked it right here, um, but you can really just Google www.trla.org and the whole website's great. You should really just go on there and click around. There's a ton of information, but if you want information specific to the winter storm, just add that backlash disaster. Um, and then one really unique tool that we have um, is this interactive map where you can click um, the area over here. So, you know, if you've identified you live in San Antonio, you can click here. And as you can see, it'll pull up a list of resources and ways um, that you can apply for FEMA or SBA or other types of benefits that might be helpful to you. Um, and that is the end of my presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And if we have any questions. We do have a few questions, Brittany. First of all, um, Guadalupe asks, I have a question during the storm, our service went, or our furnace, excuse me, went out and we had no heat. We replaced it and the cost was over $2,000. Is there a program that would reimburse us for this expense? Um, yeah, I think there's an argument to be made that FEMA might be able to provide assistance for that. I don't know that FEMA would provide a full $2,000, um, but I would go ahead, if you were in a county that was in the red um, from that map before, um, I would go ahead and apply for FEMA assistance. I would also, if you do have homeowner's insurance, you might um, read through your policy and see if that heating unit would be covered. Um, and there might be different reasons why it's included or excluded from your insurance policy. But really, if you do have insurance, take a look at it and then apply for FEMA as well as uh, the SBA disaster loan. 
Brittany, is there, could you give us the website for people who are trying to find out what category of disaster was declared in their county? You said there's a difference between ones where the money's only going to counties or the municipalities and others where individuals can ask for yeah, FEMA I will, assistance. I will put that information in a comment in um, the chat. I, I think that should work, right, Renee? Yes, um, that And will then work. If, you, if you want to apply for, um, disaster assistance, you can do that at www.disasterassistance.gov. All right. The next question um, has to deal with landscaping. So several neighbors have lost palm trees, which were older and difficult to remove the dead trees, as well as to replace the trees. Are palm trees and any other form of landscaping eligible for FEMA assistance? Um, it is unlikely that FEMA is going to pay for landscaping. Um, FEMA, like I said, FEMA's assistance is really going to be for um, making your, sure your home is safe and sanitor, sanitary. There is an option for cleanup and debris removal. I don't believe you could apply and see if they would do it. I mean, there's no harm in applying and getting it in, uh, getting the application in by April 20th. Um, there is a cleanup and debris removal option. I don't think that that has been approved for winter storm URI. So um, if they don't have that assistance available, then unlikely that that would be covered. All right. And you had mentioned a TDEM survey earlier. Could you mm -hmm. elaborate on that just a little bit? Yeah. So um, the survey is, it's called a preliminary damage assessment survey. Um, it's something that they've start our Texas Division of Emergency Management has um, done. They started it in 2020. Maybe they've done it before, but it's been more heavily relied on um, because of the pandemic. Traditionally, after a natural disaster, you would see FEMA um, employees all over the place. You would see maybe the National Guard all over the place. Um, local officials going around, walking around neighborhoods um, and categorizing damage that has occurred in that county. Because of the pandemic, um, a lot of this has moved uh, online or virtual, um, which can be sort of problematic if people don't have access to um, the internet or are unable to submit that form online. But um, the information, there's several questions in there about what county you live in, what's the address, are you the owner, um, all of that, and then there's an option to add in photos at the bottom. And you're really just trying to explain the um, damage that your home has sustained so that the county can gather that information and report it to the state, and then the state can then send it to the federal government um, and ask for that county to be included um, for individual assistance. So if you are in one of those yellow counties um, and you, you, you wanna get your county to have access to help repair homes, um, then you would need to continue to um, promote that survey as well as complete it to uh, make sure that they have all the information they need. Um, it is important to know that survey, I, I know we're in April, it feels a little redundant to try and do something now, but that survey is still open. I'm on many calls with um, FEMA and TDM over um, ev like every week and they're still heavily promoting it. They have requested an additional 30 something counties, um, but that request was done probably about a month ago. And I think for lack of you know information and data to support their claim, those counties are just kind of in limbo right now. So am I correct that this TDEM, TDEM survey should be completed by people who are in counties that are not getting full FEMA benefits to try to get the federal government to declare the disaster level for individual assistance in those yes. counties? Yes, that is correct. And I will link the survey right here in the chat so that um, if you are a uh, individual residing in one of those counties, um, you can go ahead and fill that out whenever you get a chance. All right. We do not have any other questions in the Q&A nor in the chat. I want to give people just one more chance to ask questions in the Q&A section. All right. 
And the other thing we're going to do is in the chat, I'm going to go ahead and add in um, something that Brittany mentioned several times is that we have paralegals that are dedicated specifically to answering calls from veterans about their legal issues. And one of those paralegals is Rosie. And Rosie's number is 210-212-3740. And so if you're a veteran in the San Antonio or anywhere in our service area, and you have a legal problem that you would like uh, TRLA to evaluate whether or not we can represent you or provide you with any type of advice or limited services, please feel free to call that number. What our policy is in all of our paralegal specific lines for veterans is if a veteran calls or a dependent, not only the veterans, but also dependents of veterans, um, call one of our paralegal numbers. If you don't speak to the paralegal when you call, you can leave a message and the paralegal should call you within 72 hours of your message. Um, so please leave your name and telephone number to make sure that we're able to get back in contact with you if you only are able to leave a message. Hey, I want to put, yeah, so um, to apply directly for uh, our mental health project. So for if you or someone that you know who's a veteran has um, mental health challenges, I'm going to put our paralegal, her, her name is Eileen Hasso, and I'm going to put her direct line um, in here as well. So we encourage y'all to reach out uh, directly to us as, as well. And the 800 number that is behind Brittany, the 888-988-9996, that number is our Telephone Access to Justice hotline. It's for all of TRLA services. Veterans can use it, non-veterans can use it. Um, we do require that a person be low income. And so when you call, one of the things that will happen is we'll have to gather personal information from you, um, but also we will be gathering financial information from you to determine if you're eligible for our services as a low income person. Um, so please consider that. Uh, please give us a call if you need legal help. If you're one of, one of the many service providers that are um, on this call, please share our numbers. Um, please share this information and we thank everybody for your time tonight. Any last words, Brittany or Lori? Thank right. you very thank much, you Brittany. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was really great. Okay, thank you everybody. That's it for tonight. Good night.